Okay. So we did a little bit of reading yesterday, didn't we, guys? Yeah. Do you want to just start over for Daisha, or? All we did was the author. Huh? All we did was the author. Yeah. Okay. Good point. We got through the author's note, and just to summarize that, it's an author's note, and it's John Krakauer talking to us about setting up the preface of the book. So he talks about April, 90, April 1992, a young man from a well-to-do East Coast family hitchhikes to Alaska and walks alone into the wilderness north of Mount McKinley. Four months later, his decomposed body was found by a party of moose hunters. He talks about how Chris graduated with honors, um, and then, like we talked about, he changed his name, Alexander Supertramp, and gave away, as I told you, Daisha, like, 24K, burned his cash, got rid of his car. Oh, that's this guy. Yeah, that's this guy. This is this Chris McCandless guy, um, which is what the book is all about. This author wrote an article in Outsider magazine about them finding this poor kid dead up in the woods. And it's just, people don't know why he died, you know? Like, they just knew he starved to death, but they didn't know what happened to him or why he was there or who he was. and so. Krakauer took his journals and his photos and used it to track down people Chris had run into in his travels and put together the missing gap of his two years of this dude's life since he disconnected from his family, graduating from college. Uh, he had a free ride to law school, like Harvard Law. Um, money in the bank. He was set up to go. And he just gave it all up and went and came a bomb and looking for that experience though because he's like this doesn't matter to me this money doesn't matter to me so so which of those things that we talked about does that summary yeah kind of address the six things what do you think what Hebrews. Yeah, hubris is good. Mm -hmm. Why hubris? What up? I don't know. Just guessing. Oh, Major? Yeah. So, do you think if someone gives you freaking everything and you're just like, thanks, no thanks, and peace out, would some people look at that maybe as a little bit hubris? Extremely. <laughs> Extremely. Like, sure, his family wasn't perfect, maybe. They let us get set up. How lucky is he? And they're just, and you're just like, no, actually, you're just all monetary, money, 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 and you're shallow, and you're liars, and I'm out. Like, that's harsh, buddy. That's harsh. Later on, he goes and befriends this guy, Wayne. Wayne's got all kinds of moral issues, one could say, but he idolizes the dude. And yeah, he's really harsh on his father um, and mother. When people are human. So uh, the other thing that I'd like to point out here too is living deliberately. I mean, he purposely chose to tell his parents, "No, I don't want that car." Um, he gave his twenty-four thousand dollars in to charity, um, and he just like purposely chose to basically drop out of society. So this is another. His whole thing is living deliberately. I'm not going to buy it anymore. You're okay. <laughs> he really wanted that, like it says, he, Chris McCandless really wanted that raw, transcendentalist experience. He wrote, he wrote, read a lot of uh, Leo Tolstoy, uh, War and Peace, and tried to live kind of like the authors that he super admired, like uh, Call the Wild, Jack London. Um, loved him. Call the Wild is all about this guy's trip up to Alaska. Surprise, and pitting himself across Alaska, you know, and it's his harshness and his realness. Um, realism. It's when we snapped out of the romantic area era and went into realism, like the raw of life, the raw experience, how it's not all, you know, cupcakes and rainbows and whatnot and romance. Like Shakespeare was the first one to kind of pop out of it when he wrote the ode to the somewhat non-attractive woman. 
it's a good song. Anyway, so there's that. And it finishes up with John Cracker talking about how he parallels, and part of the reason why he's so captured by this young man is he sees himself in him. And he <laughs> does this funny line, funny line where he talks about, well, I, I told you guys about this yesterday, the fragment in the book where he'll discuss his own youth and show how it compares to Chris McKenna's. But in actuality, um, it's like, Deja, he does like a whole two chapters. Mm -hmm. And he only has two chapters to four other guys in comparison. I also like to point out that they're all guys. He seems to think that this like inclination to pay yourself against nature and to get out there and have that grand adventure is just a dude thing. Surprise, speaking from in my experience, and I kind of parallel myself to Chris in some ways. No, not true. So, yet you're going to look at biases, the truth. This guy says, just fragging to himself, he gives a giant chunk of the book to himself. And then, but then he does tell you, at the end, my convictions should be apparent soon enough, but I will leave it to the reader to form, to form his or her own opinion of Chris McCandless. So as you guys go through this book, large point is looking at that truth, you know, theme number six, and forming your own. Dig through the bias, use your own opinions, your own perceptions. When you guys take the quizzes, there's no right or wrong answer. You're going to take one of the themes, show an example, how that is a theme from the book, and defend it. So you're learning how to argue, make argumentative essays, and express yourselves. And to be able to do so in a legitimate manner while people will listen to you is to have evidence and be able to support your claims. So I want you to look at the book and find supports for your claims, whatever opinion you may have. Kim thinks this guy committed huge hubris and is a selfish jerk who died needlessly and caused his family pain. She's right in a million ways. Um, as a mother, I feel her on that. Some of the other students feel like this guy's rat. He went for four months out of Alaska, kicked butt. He lived this really super raw experience. He's super intelligent. He did this with intention. Maybe think Chris is an awesome guy, an intelligent dude, which it's both, you know? His life can be complicated like that. What's up, Walter? What's the meaning of the bus on the front? Sorry, what? What's the meaning of the bus on the front gate or on the cover? Oh, so this is the bus he uh, sheltered in. Yeah, so there, um, it'll happen in chapter two, they'll explain how this bus came to be here. But bus 142 was used for loggers and whatnot. Anyways, they hold these buses up there. One was left, and this place where he goes on the Sampy Trail is in kind of a canyon. It's kind of an anomaly. So these like hunters really target it. And so they left the bus there, so it's kind of like a hunting den almost. So even though Chris was really shooting to get as isolated and out there and away from people as possible, he found that, you know, that's kind of impossible. Hey, like, hey. <laughs> he had like, you know, cabins nearby and he didn't really quite get all that far out. But he felt, but he felt good about it. Like, he uh, writes in his diary, he's like, magic bus day, when he finds the bus. <laughs> he's like, awesome. Like, I found my home. And he like, cars like a quote, you know, that he's feeling his experience. Like, I go on this two year journey as an Alexander Super Tramp. Like, the kid, the kid was out there, he was getting an adventure, you know? So that's the bus. He sheltered it on your bookmark. Um, I put a picture of the bus, because that's the end of his journey. Um, within it. And I also put happiness is only real when shared. And this guy that disconnects from his family, I think another vocab later, uh, I think he had an epiphany out there. And I think all of us get to be hubris jerks when we're young. I certainly was. It's part of the adventure of growing up. And I think at the end, when he was incredibly lonely, out there getting sick, it really brought him to the reality of, hey, my own mortality, and it settled him down and it irked him. And I think perhaps this kid started thinking about his family and his loveness, and, you know, loved ones. And maybe it's not about being 
completely on your own. Maybe he had to rebirth himself as Alexander Supertramp and go on this mission to appreciate the people that were back there taking care of him. Because he did love his, you know, he at least very much had a tight relationship with his sister. He was pissed at his dad, but, you know, and he gave his mom a beautiful Mother's Day gift before he took off. And that evidence of him writing, like, happiness only real and shared, and his actual good boy, you know, that he writes and takes a picture of him with before he dies, speaks that maybe this kid, you know, saw that value in others and family. But, so yeah. So go ahead and start this guy's journey. All right, chapter one. April 27, 1992. Greetings from Fairbanks. This is the last you shall hear from me, Wayne. I arrived here two days ago. It was very difficult to catch rides in the Yukon Territory, but I finally got here. Please return all mail I received to the sender. It might be a very long time before I return south. If this adventure proves fatal and you don't ever hear from me again, I want you to know you're a great man. And now walk into the wild, Alex. So it's a postcard received by Wayne Westenberg from Carthage, South Dakota. And this is titled The Alaska Interior. Yeah. Jan Gallion had driven four miles out of Fairbanks when he spotted a hitchhiker standing in the snow beside the road. Thumb raised high, shivering in the gray Alaska dawn. He didn't appear to be very old, 18, maybe 19 at most. A rifle protruded from the young man's backpack, but he looked friendly enough. A hitchhiker with a Remington semi onda bag isn't the sort of thing that gives motors pause in the 49th state. Galleon steered his truck onto the shoulder and told the kid to climb in. The hitchhiker swung his pack into the bed of the Ford and introduced himself as Alex. Alex? Galleon responded, fishing for a last name. Just Alex, the young man replied, pointedly rejecting the bait. Five feet seven or eight with a wiry build, he claimed to be 24 years old and said he was from South Dakota. He explained that he wanted a ride as far as the edge of Denali National Park, where he intended to walk deep into the bush and live off the land for the next few months. So right there. What's this guy's real name? Chris. Chris. And he introduced himself as Alex, right? And he doesn't even give his last name. And, like in the author's note, where is he from? South Dakota. Or no. Uh, no. <laughs> no, he's from Washington, D.C. Washington. So, what would you tie this, like, total, like, what have we talked about where, you know, you would change your name, what are you getting rid of? What is he trying to shut himself of? His identity. What's that? His identity. His identity. And where is your identity? His family. Large open for your family. Yeah, so that right there, like I was reading through, um, can't, unfortunately, mark your book, but you use a post-it, it'd be like, bam. Example of family influence right there. This guy casts away his name, lining those people around him so that they can't trace him back. Because his family actually did hire a detective to try to find their kid, obviously. They love him. So, let's continue on. Galleon, a union electrician, was on his way to Anchorage, 240 miles beyond Denali on the George Parks Highway. He told Alex he'd drop him off where he want, wherever he wanted. Alex's backpack looks as though it weighed only 25 or 30 pounds, but struck Galleon, an accomplished hunter and woodsman, as an improbably light load for a stay of several months in the backcountry, especially so early in spring. He wasn't carrying anywhere near as much food and gear as he expects a guy to carry for that kind of trip, Galleon recalls. Do you guys got any hunters or backpackers around here? What, what? So when you guys go backpacking or hunting, are you, you know, like for like, say, a week? How much are you carrying? What kind of weight you got on your back? 50 or 60 pounds. Right? Well, not really. No? No, I'd you. Say a bunch of clothes and food. You pack light, huh? Some of us do. Me, my brother, uh, back before the ACL on the Vegas, and we go backpacking together. Um, I mean, shoot, I just go up to Stanley Hot Springs. You ever been up there? Beautiful. Oh, no. You should check out Stanley Hot Springs. It's like a. It's 10 miles in, like switch back with the mountains, huge waterfalls, gorgeous hot springs, and then you can do like 30 mile loop back behind there. Super rad. Or you do uh, Bass Lake. 
You want me to do bass lake? That's still way range. Are you guys are punters, huh? Okay, well I'm going backpacking land, you guys are going hunting land, that's why we're having a problem here. So, Bass Lake, even Bass Lake, I would go for a weekend, and that's only 15 miles in. I would easily carry like 60 pounds, like you, and my brother would carry more, because, you know, he's a marine, he's a tough guy, and he really likes the best of the best. So he'll bring like, fresh links, raw eggs, <laughs> like the weirdest stuff camping. <laughs> like, I've seen him hike in a nice bottle of water, uh, you know, I don't know. He's, he's in his 40s, he's allowed to get a nice bottle of wine. So he is, uh, he's kind of ridiculous about the stuff he'll pack in. So he has a heavy, heavy pack. And this guy is going into the woods for months. But not only is he going into any kind of woods, he's not going into Montana woods, which scares me, but it's kind of gentle to us probably. But he's going into Alaska. Has anyone here been in Alaska before? No. Okay. Well, to be honest, neither have I. But my parents worked on the pipeline for a lot of years, and I have grown up with stories of Alaska and what it's like to live in Alaska. Well, my huh? grandpa was a hunting guy in Alaska. Wow. Nice. So you, so you know. So you've heard the story. So like, for instance, my mother, bless her heart, is a little bit ditzy like me. I got it honest, right? So she, <laughs> working up on the pipeline, she's like hosing out this warehouse and a bear comes up, and she doesn't know what to do. She's like, get out, get out, and hoses the bear out. <laughs> Mama didn't die, thank you. Um, I remember she told me this story where she thought she could walk. She thought it was a very short distance that she could walk from one camp to the next camp. And she's like, it's a quick, quick walk. You know, she wasn't super prepared. Like, we have, I still have my dad's old jacket it's like this green down jacket, and it's real wolf's fur that comes to a complete cone. And you have to use the wolf's fur because it actually um, will grab onto the ice particles and whatnot so that you do not breathe them in and freeze your lungs. And so you have to look through a little cone during the winter to survive. And my mother did this short walk, it's like a 15 minute walk and almost died because she wasn't bundled enough. People had to tie ropes to their outhouse to go get to the outhouse so that they wouldn't get lost on the way back and die, you know, 30 feet away from their house. Um, my dad had a friend who grabbed metal. Metal is very dangerous in Alaska because of the freezing temperatures. My dad had a friend who grabbed a gas bottle with his bare hands, way out alone, <laughs> and stuck. Could have died like that. He had to pedal on his own hand to get it to <laughs> Like wild stories come out of Alaska. Um, what's that? Ooh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, don't want to pull that whole, what is that movie with a little kid? A Christmas story? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't want to pull one of those. And then, uh, and last but not least, my father, he's like, I don't know how. But somehow I found a puddle to step in. And it like blows his mind today, like how there was melted of water there, but there was ice. And he stepped in and he broke through and his foot was in a puddle. Most of us would be like, you know, whatever. He panicked, lit up, panicked. He thought he was gonna lose his foot because of the freezing temperatures. So he just tossed it out, got to the nearest floor house, dumps his boot, a ton of water comes out, Fortunately, even back in the 70s, we had the kind of technologies where it like, you know, cocooned his foot and that water didn't freeze and it was his foot. So we're talking serious stuff. Like Alaska is pretty serious stuff. Not to mention mosquitoes and whatnot. The mosquitoes are clouds. On a taiga, they're clouds. The caribou will all herd onto the pavement and the roads to try to escape them. Um, when people go swimming, they like literally will like wear nets until they can get into the water. I don't know why you go swimming at that point. It's like my uncle, he goes on like, he goes on like a floating trip one time, and they just sat there like in the nets. Yeah. Like that was this whole fun. Yeah, but you know, people may do it, and we acclimate. I don't know. I, I can't wait till my little babies grow up and I can go do the Alaska thing. But yeah, so you guys think about it. And this guy lived four months out there, and he went in with a, what? What do we say, 25, 30 pound pack? Mm -hmm. This guy Galen said, that's wild. So, 
continuing on. So in a lot of ways, we do 